Hi there. Welcome to the Connections Church live stream. Feel free to grab a coffee or fold your laundry. Hi. Welcome to Connections. Thanks so much for joining us this week. A couple quick reminders for parents. Our children's ministry continues on Sunday mornings at 9.30 with Pastor Kyle and Commander Spaceman. You can join that via Zoom. As well for youth, we have in-person youth happening every second Friday night with Pastor Aaron, so you can get in contact with him for more details about when and where. Thanks for joining us again, and I'll pass it on to the worship team. I was so blind My sin was before me I swallowed my pride But out of the darkness You brought me to your light You showed me new mercy You opened up my eyes You saved my soul Till the very moment when I come home I sing, I dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul joy is the only sound Where's my heart forever more now In your arms I'll always be found From the day you saved my soul Till the very moment when I Come home, I sing, I dance, my heart will overflow. From the day you saved my soul.
Hi, my name's Aaron, and I'm the youth pastor with Connections Church. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. I am going to be talking about what we have been talking about the last two weeks, and that's this series called Find Your Fit. Um, we're trying to understand the ways in which it, we best, as individuals and as a community, be with Jesus. For me, this has been such an eye-opening uh, study. Uh, and I'm recognizing that though I have these very prominent pathways, these spiritual temperaments in which I relate to God, know Him, and worship Him, I find that in understanding the other pathways and, and even engaging with them, uh, I find my, my main pathways so much more rounded out and my spiritual temperament so much more cultivated. I mean, that's not to say that, you know, all the spiritual pathways are meant to be engaged in equally by every person. We're very different people, all of us, and that's a good thing. But there is value in making room for the, all the pathways to have a say in how we know and interact with God. We're going to develop that more, and that's going to be something that is big with the conclusion of the series. But today, I'm going to talk about the next two pathways, uh, and they happen to be my two highest spiritual temperaments, the activist and the caregiver. And since it's Freedom Sunday 
uh, in support of International Justice Mission, I'm going to talk about how IJM is enacting these two pathways in the fight against slavery. So first, activists. You know, Martin Luther King said, he said, the time is always right to do the right thing. He was an activist and he was a very committed Christian. He, always, he was very committed to the pursuit of righteousness and justice in our world. I'm an activist. Ask anyone who knows me. And this really showed up for me in my 20s. And as I kind of contemplated my activist pathway, I realized that this has been a part of who I am for a long time. I started out at one point trying to create a t-shirt company that um, benefited nonprofits like the Mustard Seed. And the idea, and I called it Jesus Make Me Dangerous. That's what I'm wearing right now, one of those shirts. And the idea was about trying to get people to understand, especially Christians, um, that we're called not to apathy, but to oppose it and to see the people who are unnoticed and outcast in society find a place and be valued just the same as anyone else. But you know what? That kind of fizzled out. Uh, because I really didn't know how to gain traction with it, with my activist pathway. And I also felt uh, with a lot of the activists, um, endeavors that I've pursued, I felt like I was virtue signaling more than I was actually commit, uh, contributing to some real change. So the reality is my engagements with activism have had highs and lows and I've made mistakes. The real, uh, so that tells me and shows me and something that we need to understand that the activist pathway is really prone to this fast out of the gate enthusiasm and it can lead to poor execution and, and a lot of times more talk than real action. So as we discuss it, it's key, the, the thing I want to stress is how we understand how this pathway is best lived out. So let's start with a biblical example in Moses. Uh, he was an activist. Um, and you know what? He stood for righteousness while making plenty of mistakes. And that's going to happen. We're imperfect. But when we look at Moses, so his first endeavor into activism is kind of a messy one and not in a good way. <laughs> uh, he was defending a fellow Israelite from an Egyptian and he ended up murdering that Egyptian. So he defended the oppressed by murdering the oppressor, which is another type of oppression. So poor execution on his part. And when he went, so he went to the desert to escape because Pharaoh was after him. And when he met God, God was like, I'm going to send you to free Israel. He's like, I've made you this way. I'm going to send you to do this. But Moses was reluctant because, you know, he had been burned in the past. But he went. He eventually reluctantly took up his call. And a lot of activists can be like that. Um, and he went to Pharaoh. And we all know the famous phrase, let my people go. And you know what? He had no idea what the consequences of that would be because Pharaoh was really stubborn. And so God responded with 10 plagues. You know what? Not exactly the best uh, outcome that you would expect in your first uh, going back into the activist uh, pathway. <laughs> uh, and you know what? Because of this, Pharaoh started to make it worse for the Israelites and they turned on Moses. So Moses started getting frustrated, feeling isolated, and he really questioned what God was doing. This has a tendency to lead activists into a, I'm going to just do this myself mindset and make it happen myself, which is really a recipe for disaster. It really, we need maturity as activists to temper our tenacity because we really want to see justice. We need to gain foresight to know how to approach the fight effectively. So it's really, really, really important for activists to remember that the results are up to God, not us. It's God's responsibility to bring justice. Uh, ours is to be the people who stand and oppose it. Don't stand idly by and be apathetic to it, to the evil and injustice in our world. And we get a really good warning and a lesson from Habakkuk. 
um, about what it looks, what, what attributing apathy and slowness to God. Uh, we perceive it as slowness and we perceive it as an apathy, but to actually attribute it to God, kind of not a good idea, <laughs> though I get it. And we have these feelings, but you know, in Habakkuk 1, Habakkuk says to God, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. And justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. That is a crazy accusation. To, th to hurl at God. Not crazy because... You know, it's not understandable that a person might feel this way, but the problem of accusing God is that actually it causes us to turn our back on the very source of strength that we need in, our, in, in pursuing justice and righteousness. It leads us to foolish actions, and we might even end up committing unrighteousness in pursuit of righteousness. The important thing is to remember, as an activist, is to remain humble. We're dependent on God's promises to restore and reconcile. We've got to think of ourselves as sinners too. Remember that we are sinners and that we contribute to these things and we need God, the one righteous judge, to help us do this. We've got to remember that Jesus, he's the Messiah, not us. And we're meant to follow his lead, not take the lead. We got to remember the promise of Psalm 140 that says, I know the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Surely righteous will praise your name and the upright will live in your presence. That is our hope. And as activists hope in that, they have this mantra um, that we look to in Romans 9. It says, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Most activists want to take on every fight, but we recognize we can't. Otherwise, we're going to burn out. So it's good to find passion points, those areas where we see a particular need for change and that we believe that this can be how we contribute. Um, the Christian activists, actually, is their job is to call out apathy in the church. The goal is to see the church properly witness the gospel to the world in word and deed. We're not the morality police, but we're rather a transformed people of peace, love, justice, and hope. And that's what we're aiming at. But because of the, the activists' persistent need for confrontation, people can get turned off and annoyed. I mean, we come across... Some people might become inspired by us, but they also might see us as a nuisance. And because of this, there's a fear for activists of rejection and, and being isolated and ostracized. And so some of us, and I, I find that I struggle with this, we work against our spiritual temperament and we keep quiet because we don't want to be ostracized. We want to have friends. We want to be included. And we want community. But on the other hand, there's also those who are so bent on confrontation that they're always looking for a fight. And, and this is the extreme of being an activist. So what we need to find as activists is a, is a balance between spiritual starvation and spiritual gluttony. Confrontation is nourishing to the activist soul. It actually helps us grow in our faith. But it, again, the high idea of maturity and, and really a key to, to helping with maturity is a support system that teaches us and helps us know how to eat right. Or in other words, focus this pathway well. So a support system, a community of like-minded activists or just people who see the value in a person's uh, spiritual temperament as an activist help 
um, give courage and support for the reluctant activist who's afraid to speak up. And then for the overeager activist, they can be tempered by the experienced activist's wisdom, along with the wisdom of other temperaments and engaging in other temperaments on how to best reach people in their apathy. It's about being holistic. But unfortunately, and to quote the pop punk philosophers Newfound Glory, if you haven't made enemies, you haven't stood for anything. The reality is activism is going to make enemies. There's always going to be someone who doesn't like what you're talking about, who doesn't like that you're so adamant on it, that who disagrees, who opposes you. And that's just human nature in some regards. And then there's just people who they want to cling to what injustice provides them. But, you know, a mature activist works hard at making friends out of enemies. That means taking heat and risking rejection because you care about them, you want them to acknowledge the problem you're addressing. The reality is, activism is evangelism. It's for people's salvation as much as it is for the social issue. We're putting into context the problems of humanity in the context of the kingdom and God's mission. Jesus is gospel. But as much as this is nourishing and good, for our souls. It's taxing. It drains us. And this comes into kind of taking on, taking the cues from other spiritual temperaments. One that really fits into the activist um, temperament uh, is the contemplative. And Thomas Merton, a famous Christian contemplative, talks of activists as those who engage in a masked contemplation, that in their activism, they're actually contemplating God. They're orienting themselves around God's love and they're motivated by that. And continually, and activism just feeds the contemplation. But if you're doing activism for activism's sake, you're only going to be drained rather than being filled. And you need to put your focus and your motivation on God and his love and what he's doing. That there's God's love is so important that people need to know it and know the things that that keep them from it. They need to be rescued. So rather than climbing a mountain and meditating to contemplate God, the activist actually gets in the mud and gets their hands dirty. But as much as the activist pathway is good, there are temptations that activists are prone to. And first is judgmentalism and the idea that we see everyone else as apathetic and they don't care. Also, with admit, at the ambition of activism, it, it, activists are ambitious and they want to see big changes in the world and they want to be part of it. This can that, that ambition and then the admiration of others who look up to you can actually lead us to compromise in moral integrity that we might even might manipulate people and might even be seduced to the celebrity of it. And then there's elitism and resentment, just like in 1 Samuel 30 when uh, David's soldiers who actually went and fought the war and those who thought that those who stayed back to protect our good their goods and the camp didn't deserve as much of the spoil as they did. This idea that because we're doing the work as activists, we get the credit. We get the credit. You had nothing to do with it, you people who sit on the sidelines. The reality is that people who sit on the sidelines might not be sitting on the sidelines. They might actually be contributing to the fight on the ground behind the scenes. And then there's preoccupation with activity, which is act activism for activism's sake, which is just idolatry. We're not doing it for God. We're doing it for the thrill of the activism and we're doing it for ourselves and how it makes us feel. And then finally, there's lack, a, a lack of emphasis on personal sanctity, sanctity. It's that idea from Matthew 7 where Jesus said, you got to take the log out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in your brothers. Activists need to remember that they are sinners too, whom God has called to a new life. So they need to be really self-critical. Um, not in a bad way, but so that they are making sure that they're practicing what they're preaching. So the activists 
This is the sum up is that they remind the church of its calling to be a place of justice and righteousness in a world that oppresses, belittles, demeans, and discriminates. And the activist is motivated by the love of God and the image bearing value of each and every human being. And they want to make these things known. That's what makes them important in the church. And that's why we all need a little bit of activism in our lives. A natural compliment to the activist is the caregiver. Mother Teresa said, I'm not sure exactly what heaven will be like, but I do know that when we die and it comes for time for God to judge us, he will not ask, how many good things have you done in your life? Rather, he will ask, how much love did you put into what you did? Mother Teresa was a caregiver, but her caregiving was activism in its most just gracious and loving form. Caregivers and activists are very much connected. These two actually are tied for my highest spiritual temperament. And I believe the reason for that lies in the fact that both are motivated by God's unrelenting love. Activists do what they do because of God's love and they care about people and caregivers are the same. For myself, caregiving, like I said, has been a natural complement to my activism. I end up actually wanting to practice what I preach and put love into the world. But if I'm honest, it's a hard thing to give love because it really takes a lot out of you unless you're really relying on God's love. As much as it may be my temperament, I fall short of giving love way too often. I mean, I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect son. I'm not a perfect friend. I'm not a perfect neighbor. And why? Because of sin. My love is imperfect. God's love, however, is unrelentingly imperfect. And that's the love that we're trying to show the world. That's who we're, what the love that we're relying on. Unfortunately, sin distorts and distracts from our spiritual temperaments. And so thus, understanding and intentionally cultivating our spiritual temperaments, our sacred pathways, is how we overcome evil by overcoming our own sin. The fact is, caregiving works against sin. And it works against the sin that seems to underlie most sins, which is selfishness. And like I said, care, like with Mother Teresa, caregiving is itself an act of t activism because to care for others is an act of resistance against the evils of apathy, selfishness, and hate. So let's look at a biblical caregiver. Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who took her in when she was orphaned at a young age. You know, he did that out of a caregiving nature. Uh, and you know what? Because he cared so much about Esther, when she was brought into the king's harem, which is not exactly, you know, in the ancient times, maybe it's been sanitized the way we read this, but the fact is she was part of the group of women that were meant to be sexual um, slaves to the king. Though, yeah, they got taken care of. They were still forced into this. They didn't have a choice. And because he cared so much about her, Mordecai checked on her all the time, regularly. And then, you know, he was a caregiver even to the king who was not a Jew um, by, you know, reporting a plot that was meant, to, that was seeking to kill the king. And because of his caregiving nature, he moved into activism often. He refused before Haman, um, this guy who was who worked for the king, who he, he only chose to serve others when it served God's will. But when it came to Haman demanding that people bow before him, Mordecai wasn't a people pleaser and he said no. And when that caused Haman to plot to kill the entire Jewish nation, 
moved him to activism more. Mordecai, he moved into activism. He sought, he persistently encouraged Esther to use her influence to stop it by appealing to the king. Because Esther actually held a special place in the king's harem. He, he, he liked her probably more than the rest of the women. And then once they were successful and they saved the Jewish nation together, Mordecai and Esther, Mordecai commemorated a festival of God's salvation of the Jews, and the whole focus was to care for the poor, to make sure that the poor were taken care of, that an extra giving of resources and money and, and providing for the needs of the poor took place. And it all started with caring for an orphan. That's what caregiving can do. Throughout the Bible, we see many calls to caregiving, like with the Good Samaritan. And in 1 John 3, when, where it talks about Jesus being the example of caregiving that we look to. And Philippians 2, that caregiving is the key to humility. In Hebrews 6, caregiving, God talks about his justice and caregiving as interconnected. And then James 1.27, that true religion is caregiving. And in 1 Peter 4, that says all gifts and temperaments can, no, wait, must engage in caregiving. And you know what? We re, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know how it's been played that like it was sexual immorality that was the big issue in Sodom and Gomorrah and why God destroyed it? No. It says in Ezekiel that this was the sin of Sodom. They did not help the poor and needy. Crazy to think that neglecting the poor deserves fire from heaven. <laughs> and when Jesus spoke in Matthew 25, he spoke about how serving others is serving God, that it is your service to God to serve other people, especially the poor and needy, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. There is a preferential uh, option for the poor that Jesus speaks about in, in the Gospels. That's important for us as Christians to understand. The reality is that caregivers are like prophets. The caregiver, is a, as Gary Thomas puts it, is a witness to God's existence by demonstrating his love through the giving of care. Our natural human response is selfishness. We are bent on serving ourselves. It's what ancient theologians called in curvatus in se, which is Latin for turned in on oneself. The reality is that when we engage in compassion, it stirs up a prophetic wisdom because when we see that when we are selfless, our eyes are opened to the selfishness in ourselves and those around us, and we begin to resist the natural inclinations of selfishness in view of a common good and the realization of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But as much as all that is very good, there's still the temptations that caregivers have. Temptations, just like activists, of judging, thinking that everyone is apathetic and self-centered, and that we're the only ones who care. We don't know everyone else, and we have to remember that our job is to focus on what God's asked us to do, not what everyone else is asked to do. 
there's also the temptation to serve ourselves by serving others, which is like a way to help our self-esteem and also and then becomes a form of idolatry. There's also the temptation to hold narrow definitions of uh, between, especially between caregivers and activists, looking at activists as if they're just talking and not doing and that act, caregivers are just doing. And then there's the big temptation of neglecting those closest to us. And as much as we need to value others and strangers, as, as much as we value our family and friends, caregiving is good, but not if it makes us bad husbands, bad wives, bad fathers, bad brothers or sisters. But to sum up the caregiving uh, pathway caregivers are those who help us prioritize compassion as a practical and prophetic action in serving God's mission the mission of reconciliation and redemption and the caregiver is subversive and we uh, the caregiver disrupts the human tendency human tendency to focus on the self and we live in a world where focus on self is very prominent we point uh, the caregiver points to Jesus' self-sacrificing work in his life, death, and resurrection, which is carried forward by the Holy Spirit's work in and through the church. So with all that being said, it's Freedom Sunday. And we're talking about and seeking support, more support financially, spiritually, um, and bring awareness to the issue of slavery um, for I, uh, International Justice Mission. Uh, just a few things about International Justice Mission, if you're, not, if you're not familiar, is that they are an international anti-slavery and anti-trafficking organization. And they're a Christian organization that actually seeks to embody the spiritual temperaments of activism and, and caregiving at the organizational level. They may not necessarily consciously be thinking about, we need to be an activist and caregiving organization. It's just, they're just doing it. They see that as something that God has called the church to be a part of. Their work is aimed at eradicating the evils of slavery and human trafficking and by working in collaboration with justice systems and law enforcement throughout the world. Uh, moreover, uh, they're committed to seeing victims of human trafficking find healing and restoration for better lives. The reality is, for them, this is about bringing the kingdom as it is in heaven to the most vulnerable and exploited populations in the world. Their, their vision is to rescue millions, protect billions, and make justice of the poor unstoppable. And this is integral to Jesus' mission. When we look at Luke 4, when Jesus inaugurated his mission on earth his ministry before he goes uh, on his way to the cross he says the spirit of the lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and he was speaking in the synagogue this is significant for for a jewish audience he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim proclaim the year of the lord's favor and then he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your healing, hearing. Essentially, Jesus just mic dropped and he said, I'm here to do exactly what was foretold in Isaiah. And that's Isaiah chapter 61. He was quoting that. So, in keeping with Jesus' mission, we recognize in this world uh, here's the facts of slavery. Over 40 million are in slavery, and this is more than, uh, more than any other time in history. It's an industry that gen generates $150 billion annually. $150 billion by exploiting human beings. And the worst stat that always puts a pit in my stomach is one in four victims is a child. And usually because they're being sexually exploited. Exploited. So what IJM is doing, they're working to locate and, and rescue the victims. And they have rescued more than 49,000 to date, which is something to really be stoked on. 
people finding freedom and liberation. That's Jesus' mission. That they want to hold perpetrators legally accountable and they have more than 1,600 convictions. And they work to prevent further crimes by strengthening the justice systems in these countries and collaboration with law enforcement and the justice systems. They create reform efforts, for example, training over 67,000 justice officials. And this protects over 150 million people in 19 global communities. That's amazing. The work that they're doing is having an effect. And it's all because they see Jesus' mission as activism and caregiving. That is the big part that they aim to uh, uh, embody, enact, and motivate others into. So this is how they respond to what it says in Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. They are not letting the evil win. This is God at work in the lives of people who take very seriously the gospel and the image-bearing value of every human being. Their aftercare programs help victims return to normal lives free of abuse and exploitation. They provide trauma-focused therapy preparation for testimony in court, education and employment opportunities, and stable living environments to help heal and get back on their feet with their families. Through their commitment to caring for the victims, IJM witnesses to the love and justice of God. So you can be a part of that. You don't necessarily have to be the people working on the ground, but you can contribute. And we're hoping and encouraging all of you today to sign up as a freedom partner. Tap into a little bit of that activism. Tap into that caregiving. You choose how much you give and every little bit helps. It's a monthly thing. It doesn't have to be huge. The average is $31. We're hoping that everyone can commit to that. And this month, if you sign up, your contribution is matched. Steph and I have been Freedom Partners since last year. I love it. To know that the money that God is giving me, we can contribute to seeing the lives of people improved. That we can see the mission and the gospel enacted in a way that is so significant that this world needs to see that testifies to the existence of God. And it's just $31. And that's not to say that $31 isn't a significant amount for some people. It is. It, it takes some sacrifice, but it's worth it. But if you can't give financially, and that's okay, different situations call for different action. You can at least sign up to be a prayer partner and get the updates and all the what's what's going on with IJM and what they're doing, and you can pray. And you get you can get to some activism in prayer and some caregiving in prayer. As IJM works to rescue and restore in Jesus' name. I pray that we as a community would not only work with organizations like RJM, but in our lives, we would tap into the activism and the caregiving, uh, though it may not be our most prominent, is there to know and be with Jesus and serve his mission. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have called us to different action. And that together, in our different spiritual temperaments, we all can contribute to the gospel and the furthering of the mission and to see the kingdom as it is in heaven here on earth. I pray that, Father, you would inspire and convict us, that you would call us into action. You would help us contemplate you through serving others, that we would seek to be prophetic in the practical. Help us know how we know you best 
and how each of us in our temperaments can help each other know you best as a community and as disciples wanting to follow Jesus faithfully. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoy the discussion you just watched. We hope that it's, it's going to stimulate further discussion and even bring up some questions. Well, with those questions, we just encourage you to ask them, and you can ask them to us by just te texting NEXT to 587-611-20, and we'd love to have a conversation with you. Or if you'd like to be a part of a missional, com missional community, which is a lot about furthering the discussion, you can text sign up to 587-611-20. And again, somebody will get in contact with you and just tell you a little bit more of what missional community is. Before you go, don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a great week.